Uh, let's see. This is a talk about Kubernetes 101, uh, but we're actually going to talk about Docker and a whole lot of stuff uh, related to it. Just we're going to basically build up an application, a simple Sinatra application, uh, put it through Docker Compose, and then uh, it, try and get into Kubernetes as easy as possible. Uh, I'm uh, Ben Cochran, a uh, former, well, sort of full stack Ruby developer, 15 years experience in enterprise, freelance, and startup environments. Uh, right now, I'm the head of machine learning engineering at Crow LLP. Crow! <laughs> uh, in uh, Crow LLP's data science business unit. Uh, we're growing pretty fast, and uh, I'm actually hiring. I'm looking to hire three machine learning engineers. Uh, I posted it on the Indie Hackers job board this afternoon, and also in the Indie Hackers job board <laughs> Slack. Uh, if you are the one person that is looking uh, for employment, come talk to me. If you're, uh, <laughs> come talk to me anyway. Uh, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I didn't have a chance to find a ton of GIFs to load into my presentation. Maybe I'll shoot for that next time. But uh, what is Kubernetes? Uh, Kubernetes is an or orchestration engine that facilitates the scheduling of Docker containers in a reliable fashion. Uh, it's highly configurable and it uh, is really awesome. Uh, you start with Docker. Docker is an application. Uh, it could, allows you to run application specific workflows uh, instead of putting them in virtual machines and wasting a whole bunch of resources. You're able to get a you're able to put multiple applications in like what you would run a normal VM in. So why Docker? Uh, containers are lightweight, uh, low overhead. There's no hypervisor that you have to contend with. Uh, the file system that Docker uses is actually pretty neat. It's a layer-based file system. So uh, you take the base layers of an OS and you encapsulate those into like four or five different layers, and then you build a couple of libraries on top, add three, four, or five more layers, and then you put your application on top, three, four, five more layers, and then that, those 12 to 15 layers plus uh, incorporate uh, your Docker image, and you uh, basically ship those off into the cloud, uh, or wherever, on-prem, um, and so, Somebody can reuse those layers if, uh, if they're the same layer. So if you have a base Ubuntu image, you're basically reusing the same eight layers or whatever, and just all you have to pull, if you've already pulled the Ubuntu, is whatever you put on top of it. Uh, containers are extensible, and uh, you can have more efficient usage over virtual machines, for sure. Uh, so I created, can you see that? I can zoom in or zoom out, just uh, just let me know. I created a, uh, I created a simple uh, Sinatra app. Uh, it just displays one line. Uh, there's a thing to debug later if we want to. Um, so how do you get this into, how do you get, get it to run into Docker? To get it to run normally, you do you just run it. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, you want to run it in Docker. You create a Docker file. Uh, pretty simple. Start with the Ruby that you want to use, add, some, add your gem files, uh, do the bundle install, so on and so forth. Expose the port and uh, the same command that I used to run the Sinatra app, you put it in the command directive. Well, that's cool. So when you want to run it, 
just do something like this, uh, but first you actually have to build it. So the build process is each step is building the, the layer of the, uh, the eventual image. Uh, so you run it. Still thinking it's taking up the port from when I uh, created the application before. Uh, so you run the Sinatra container. It basically looks exactly like you would uh, like it did before. Actually, uses the same port. Looks the same. Cool. Um, where do you go from there? You create, uh, you can use this tool called Docker Compose. And that ba it basically is a wrapper around Docker. So uh, you can def define wherever your, um, your registry is. Uh, so this, in this case, is Google Cloud Registry. Um, give it an image name, optional tag, uh, ports that you want to expose if you want to have any persistent volumes you stick those in there uh, and then there's a couple of extra uh, annotations that you can put in there so that when you convert it to kubernetes uh, you can give it the domain you want any tls secrets for https uh, volume sizes uh, and then you can also add in your ancillary services. So uh, right here we put in uh, Redis, uh, and then there's a demo data image. Uh, Docker Compose is really easy to use. All you have to do is So the nice thing about Docker Compose is you uh, you get a single stream output. So uh, your Redis here uh, comes in line with your web process, so you can uh, see everything at once. You don't have to dig through different log files, so on and so forth. So it's real handy when you're doing development. Uh, and this will again. Oh, this will, this is the the build image, which is slightly different. So we'll say docker compose build, it'll go through the list and build any images that you want to, uh, that you have configured in your YAML. And now if you go through, you will see that it actually looks like what it did before. I just hadn't rebuilt it yet. Uh, 
pushing to the cloud, your cloud registries, whatnot, uh, is really easy. Just Docker Compose push. So this may or may not take a long time, but I'll just skip it. All right. Um, but not that one. So we went over Docker, Docker Compose, Helm. Uh, so Helm is a Kubernetes package manager. Uh, basically, uh, it's you know, if you're familiar with uh, uh, mustache syntax, uh, or variable substitution, it's like that, or Jinja and Python. Uh, so it's like a, it takes the YAML files that Kubernetes expects, gives you an interface to uh, do double handle or handlebar uh, variable substitution for URLs and ports and whatnot. Uh, and then there's a tool called Compose with a K, which is interesting because it takes the it takes the Docker Compose YAML and uh, converts it into a Helm chart really easily. Um, so all you have to do is compose with a C, or compose convert with a C, and it'll go in and create all of the... So we had two services in the Docker Compose, so it created the Sinatra and the Redis uh, deployments and all the other stuff that goes along with it. We had a demo data volume that wasn't doing anything, but uh, since it's in there, it created the, the data volume too. So when you deploy this chart into the cloud, it'll have the Redis service, the Sinatra service, and a persistent volume to store your data persistently. Let's come back to that. So uh, high level Kubernetes, what is it? Uh, it consists of a, a master, which uh, does all of the orchestration and scheduling. Uh, and then the Kubernetes nodes, which uh, do the actual workloads. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing about the Kubernetes masters is uh, the nodes actually go and ask the master for the desired state. And if the, the nodes are registered with the master, the node, if it is able to, tries to replicate the desired state as best as possible. So uh, the node, if the node goes down, uh, eventually, if, if, the nodes go, if the node goes down, uh, eventually the master will uh, say like, oh, I've lost contact with this one, I better reschedule. So uh, just go ahead and does it. Uh, goals of Kubernetes, uh, load balancing, scheduling, and resource management. Um, so uh, the, the primitive service, the ingress, serves as your, uh, your outside load balancer. So uh, you want to use NGINX to run all your stuff. You want to have web application firewalls, so on and so forth. Uh, you can put all that all those eggs into one basket and have all your apps use the same pathway. Uh, each application ends up being a service and then uh, those services end up being pods with these blue and green dots here. Uh, the scheduler, uh, so the interesting thing about the blue dots is you can decide how, however many uh, pods you want uh, and then you can scale them horizontally. So. Uh, <laughs> And also, if you have resources on any given node that you wanted to uh, make sure that your pods were on any given one, you can uh, define allocations. Uh, what do you call it? Memory's escaping me, sorry. Uh, if I think of it, I'll come back to it. Um, 
So I was talking about containerization versus virtualization before uh, hypervisors. So the virtualized environment, you have to pay the cost of a hypervisor OS. And then every virtual machine you have, you have to pay the, you have to have an install of it somewhere on the disk with its bins and libraries and then the application on top of it. And then you replicate that for as many applications as you're running because you have one per VM. Uh, as mentioned, you get to, uh, you don't have the hypervisor and then uh, your host OS, usually Linux, shares the same base images and then it, all you're really uh, duplicating here is your specific bins, libs, and then your applications. Uh, so what are the main Kubernetes primitives? We have pods, services, deployments, persistent volumes, and ingresses. Pods are the base unit. Uh, they consist of one container. So in the example that we're running right now, the Sinatra service has a one-to-end pods. Um, you can horizontally scale them. You can have one pod, you can have 10. Um, you can have multiple containers in a pod. Usually that's done uh, what is with referred, uh, that's done with what is referred to as a sidecar pattern. Each pod in the Kubernetes private network has its own IP address. Services are uh, basically little load balancers that interface, uh, that, that serves the interface between your one to many pods. So if you have one pod, the service just points to that one. If you have 10 pods, the service will load balance uh, in a round-robin fashion across your 10 pods. Uh, you can have four different modes. You can have cluster IP. Uh, basically, it just gives you a, an internal cluster IP. Uh, you can do a node port. You can actually bind to a node's port, a uh, Kubernetes node. Uh, load balancer where you can uh, tie it to any you can tie it to a cloud IP um, if you're using AKS you have to add an additional annotation uh, in order to stay inside of like the Azure private network uh, if you desire to do such a thing um, and then there's external port where you can basically say uh, an internal service DNS name inside of Kubernetes points to something outside, like an outside service on a dumb cloud or whatever. Uh, deployments are the vehicle to that provide the, the pod horizontal scaling. So you say you want one pod, uh, so you scale to one. Uh, if you want 10 pods, you scale to 10, and it'll automatically expand and contract the, the available pods or the available pod pool to match your desired state. Uh, the pod auto scaling is typically done with health checks and met metrics-based scaling. So uh, it's also self-healing. So if you, one of your pods crashes, the deployment realizes it's lost one. Uh, and so it'll, uh, it'll spawn another pod to, to match your desired config, uh, which is real nice for self-healing. Persistent volumes are a storage that persists a pod, a, across pod deletions or evictions. Uh, you put these in network storage. Uh, you can utilize distributed storage, FFS, so on and so forth. Um, when you boil it down, it's kind of just a, a wrapper around Docker volumes. They behave somewhat in, the, uh, in a similar fashion. Ingresses are uh, external access to cluster services. Uh, typically, you can use NGINX ingress or uh, Trafic, they're pretty popular options. Uh, you expose usually um, a wildcard domain to 
a particular ingress. And so if you have a, a service that you want to expose, you usually say service name dot uh, cluster dot org. Okay. Let's see if we can get our uh, Docker Compose that we've converted. We'll take a look at it real quick. Uh, so the first file that uh, Compose with a K generated is uh, the demo data. So uh, a persistent volume claim will wind up uh, as a persistent volume. Demo data, it was, we requested one gig in the Docker Compose, so it's one gig. Uh, the next one is the read as service deployment. So metadata here. Uh, but at the end of the day, the deployment spec says I want read as, uh, and then it has a default uh, starting value of one. So you get one pot of read out of this. The Sinatra deployment has the same metadata. You'll find that it has this, the image is sourced from whatever was in the Docker, uh, the Docker Compose file. So when you deploy this to the cloud, Kubernetes will try and grab, uh, will grab the image uh, from the container registry that you've specified. We're not really using the volume mount, but it's there. This will mount this path inside of the container. Um, and anything that you store in there <coughs> persists. So you can delete the pod, you bring back another one, it'll have access to the same data. Uh, sometimes there are gotchas uh, with the persistent volumes. Uh, typically, you have a read write many or read write write once. So if you have multiple pods trying to get access to the same persistent volume and it's read write once, uh, the second pod and the third pod and the fourth pod will throw errors because it can't get access to it. So if you want to have multi, you want to have storage that multiple pods can access, uh, define your persistent volume as read write many. Ingress, so you can see that uh, the ingress that was generated uh, has the same URL that was presented. And on the back end, it's saying that uh, sinatra.amhaza.cloud points to inside of Kubernetes, there's a service called Sinatra and at a port 4567. And these are all uh, usually done in a namespace fashion. So, uh, but the Helm, when you present it with a template, doesn't really uh, spell out the namespace. It's up to you to define when you want to deploy the Helm chart, what namespace it's going to go into. And then, last but not least, the service. Just saying that uh, there's a service named Sinatra. So if I have five Sinatra pods, it'll load balance in between all all five of them at four five six seven or four 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 five six seven. All right. So, once you have the Helm chart generated, you go to Helm, and Helm 
as you can see on this particular cloud has a wide variety of applications installed. So like Nginx Ingress, Open Functions as a Service, GitLab, CACMD, Mongo databases, uh, Node-RED, Redis. Uh, so let's throw uh, our new Sinatra service into the mix. So we want to Helm install. We'll just call this two. So this will install. Have to go into the directory with the Helm chart. Now let's try it. So you install it, and so it's created the namespace Sinatra Hello 2. Uh, see the persistent volume claim is pending. The service has a cluster IP, so 44567. There's a one Redis pod and one Sinatra pod. The ingress is pointing to sinatra.hazza.cloud. And at this stage, the Redis container is creating a code. But you can go in and say, did my stuff wind up deploying right? Uh, you can get the status of the deployment. It says deployed, all the stuff is up. And if you look at and the namespace that you created. Cool, they're, just, they're created. Um, and I bet if we go to Oh, I don't think I've pushed. Okay, so it actually kind of worked. Um, it didn't push the updated image because it looked like it was going to take a long time. But uh, this is the one that I was working with earlier. So I think that covers it. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm still trying to wrap my head around Kubernetes a little bit. There are config shadows there. Just do one of the readings back here. Sure. So I built this thing with Kubernetes. Is the gist that? That's exactly right. That's ex okay. So that's so I can deploy it to Azure, AWS, something on prem. It doesn't matter. I'm not coupled to any of those kind of things. That's the gist of why I have this. Yeah, it's a it's a platform. Uh, it's a platform that uh, winds up being cloud agnostic. So all the cloud specific stuff you tackle when you're creating a Kubernetes cluster. So if you're the administrator, you have to go through it. You know, like what's a load balancer in Azure look like versus what what is one in Google Cloud? Uh, what does one look like on prem? Uh, you can do layer two propagation to do on prem load balancing, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, when you've ex installed Kubernetes successfully, the interface is uh, extremely consistent, no matter where you end up. All right. So wherever I go, they say. Yeah. A pod is a Docker can uh, could be one or more Docker containers, but typically it's an instance of a Docker container. I'm not one hundred percent sure on that. I think uh, Kubernetes predated Azure. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you run into any file system bottlenecks where, like, the read/write I/O doesn't keep up with what we'd expect it's running, uh, just on hardware? Uh, the only 
time that I've run into bottlenecks is if I've if I've just had a small pipe to work with. So if I was using like USB 3 hard drive or something like that and I was jamming a lot of stuff through. Do you use Docker for Mac? Uh, say what? Uh, Docker for Mac. Docker for Mac? Yeah. Yeah, when I was using a Mac, yeah. Okay. It's just, um, I run into a lot of issues with hypervisor. So when a there were Docker for Mac like was there was two flavors there was like the virtual the, the straight virtual machine one where it like created a virtual box virtual machine I had a lot of problems with that but the new stuff uh, where it kind of hides the virtual machine behind the scenes I haven't had that much problem with. Yeah. So you mentioned that you like mount your containers on shared libraries is that? Correct, or like shared volumes, is that? It's a, it's a layered file system. Okay. So when you uh, start up a Docker container with an image, it's just all of the, uh, all the Docker layers uh, uh, union together, basically. And so does that mean that multiple services can share resources like files uh no so okay. it, it's separate so when you instantiate the uh, docker container it just uses it to build the wh whatever's resident in memory uh, it doesn't actually like if you so all, all the layers are read only at that point and anything that you write on top of it is uh, future uh, additional layers during the runtime. Who owns, runs, or maintains Kubernetes such that for a next year, well, since old stuff we have to keep in, now it's not available. Who, who's behind? Who's behind Kubernetes? Yeah. Uh, Google. Yeah, Google's the main player uh, in the, all the Kubernetes design. Depends on who you ask, but they. Uh, they sort of designed it after their, their Borg system. So they took what they learned from creating the Borg system and uh, turned it into Kubernetes. Does it have competitors like for my responsible for like AWS? Are they building their own on this? I would say like competitor wise, uh, like OpenStack and all the other ones that are but like none of them are really close to like what Kubernetes does. In fact, I think Microsoft embraces Kubernetes, you would say, because they, they give you the option of hosting it in Azure. Do you have any uh, good rule of thumb for when to start using either Docker or In terms of like the development cycle? Uh, yeah, or like project scale. You know, if we're on Heroku right now, we have two backups. Is this like that's so small compared to any of this that it's not worth it, or are we? I would say if you're like maybe like five to ten services, it starts to make sense. Uh, if you're doing coordination between more than five Heroku services, it can be somewhat challenging, but uh, if you wanted to like unite your monitoring and your alerting all under one banner, that's when the Kubernetes starts to make a bit of sense, right? Uh, to like, you it for in Heroku, when I used it, uh, always had third party services do the monitoring, but like, you can actually bake in monitoring inside of your Kubernetes clusters. So it's more about the number of moving pieces you're trying to coordinate. Yeah, if you want to consider the scale or the uh, number of points. Yeah, I would definitely say that. 